Well, thank you everybody for inviting me once again. I'm always uh, very happy to meet people that I know and meet new people and to come once more into the familiar territory of Nalwick. I've been coming now for many years. I, I think I'm one of these people that's been around for a very long time too. So I felt quite uh, uh, comfortable when uh, Jill was introduced. I thought, oh, he really could be talking about me. So thank you. Um, it's lovely to be here. And I was particularly interested to see the topic, talking it through, speaking, listening and learning English as an additional language. For those of you that have known me for many years, you'll know that I've always been, uh, that I've been very concerned at the very big emphasis, uh, particularly in uh, literacy in the early years in Australia with the emphasis on reading and writing and very little uh, discussion around the importance of oral language. And so when I saw this I thought, oh, we're finally getting the message, talking it through, speaking, listening and learning English as an additional language. I wanted to, um, to, to uh, draw attention to eight key points for uh, um, the early years, which is the area that I work predominantly in. The, uh, the Free Kindergarten Association is a uh, organisation that works in the children in the 0 to 5 age group, um, and we're a statewide uh, multicultural resource centre and a service that supports children learning English as an additional language in programs from 0 uh, to 5. We have Commonwealth and state funded. Our Commonwealth funding is um, in jeopardy at the moment, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen after four months, but um, for those of you that work in the ethnic minority area, you'll know what I'm talking about. We're constantly having to battle for funding, and in the 26 years that I've been working in this particular area, it's been a battle probably for the whole of the 26 years. So, The eight key points that I want to talk about are a sense of belonging, a resilience, the role of the first language, a provision of a socio-cultural environment, developing a sense of community, listening to children and children as listeners, purposeful collaboration and parents as partners. So if we think about a sense of belonging, what sort of environments are children moving into? Children who come from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, what is the environment like that they're moving into? What, is, what are the attitudes of the staff that are working with and how do they feel when they come into an environment what are their rights as learners? What are their rights in terms of their cultural and linguistic heritage? How can they develop a very strong positive self-concept and a pride in themselves which will help them as learners? We need to think about and acknowledge and, and recognise uh, the children's cultural and linguistic heritage and this needs to be shown by others. Um, so to develop, to acknowledge and recognise um, the children's first language and their culture, class, religion, spirituality and ability. I've included the word spirituality. I've been doing a little bit of work with our indigenous communities and um, during this year and spirituality is very high on their agenda and I think in terms of some of the families that we're now having coming to Australia, particularly from the Horn of Africa, South Sudanese, which is the largest group coming currently into Australia, we have to think more about what are, what are the areas that we need to cover. Resilience. I think this is very important. One of the key qualities of the effective learner is the ability to stay engaged with the learning environment. Resilient learners are more inclined to be risk takers and take on challenges and persist with learning and recover from failures. I think it's very, it was very evident in the research that I undertook of the children the children that were the risk takers were the ones that would be happy to talk, happy to join in conversations, happy to even go and talk to someone in their own language even if they uh, knew that they didn't really understand that. That didn't matter to them. They were children that were out there, they were getting ready for learning, whereas the children who were shy and withdrawn, who had felt less confident in themselves as learners, they were more inclined to retreat or to wait for others and they were the children that perhaps we're in danger of becoming peripheral interactors and they were children that we need to really take notice of. So I think it's very important that we consider resilience as a factor that's really important in children. The role of the first language. And I've been pleased to see that the issues around 
the importance of the first language or the home language are beginning to perhaps take a bit more prominence here. There's something that we've um, been working with um, in Australia, I guess in the early childhood field, this is something that we believe is absolutely paramount, the role of the first language in terms of the first language is the basis, forming the basis for the development of English as an additional language. And it's something that we've really been promoting and pushing and encouraging. And I think particularly now um, in the area that I've been doing quite a lot of work around, it's in the area of children's rights. And we're talking about children's linguistic and cultural rights. And I think we have to really push the idea that these families are entitled to utilise their first language, to be supported, to learn that first language within the, uh, in the school setting. So providing opportunities for learners to continue using their first language demonstrates to learners that their first language and the language used in their community is valued and respected. Provision of a socio-cultural environment. Uh, perhaps one of the growing areas now in Australia in the early childhood field is the development of socio-cultural environments. Of uh, the theory around um, socio-cultural theory is beginning to uh, take um, some prominence in the training of uh, teachers to work in the early years. Cultures play a large role in shaping the development of individual <coughs> minds. Children need access to a socio-cultural environment that builds on their knowledge and skills and takes account of their cultural and language background. The lack of experience of children learning English as an additional language with the culture and the language of the nursery or school can inhibit access to opportunities for interaction. Opportunities to participate in activities and conversations are determined by the way children position themselves with others. Teachers need to be skilled in extended discourse to provide scaffolds for children's oral language. And in the workshop that I um, conduct this afternoon, I'm going to look very much at the environment. It's a very practically based workshops that looking at what sort of environments do we need to promote um, listening and speaking in children. Developing a community of practice, and again I use the Lave and Winger terminology. Practices can be described as the way things are done, the ways we talk, what we believe in and value, and the relationships we have with others, including who holds the power. I'm interested in um, I'm going to be doing some work in Huddersfield in a few uh, weeks' time and I'm uh, going to be talking to heads and administrators, which is perhaps not what I normally talk to, so it'll be a bit of a challenge. Uh, but I'm going to be talking very much about curriculum issues and about um, social practice in terms of whose curriculum is it and how do we, are we expecting children to fit into our pre-existed curriculum and how is it that we can encourage children to learn when perhaps the curriculum is so foreign to what they're used to and to what, uh, to what um, we want for, for families? And also, what is the role of the community and how, and families perhaps who come from cultures where the community is, it has a very strong focus, what are we doing about um, involving and um, uh, asking the families what it is that they want for their children? Classrooms need to be sites of practice rather than sites of linguistic transaction. Language learning needs to be seen as social practice. Emphasis is not on production of increasingly more complex English, better formed and more varied sentences, but on the ability to take part in interaction. <coughs> Listening to children and children as listeners. One of the very big uh, pushes in Australia is the uh, Reggio Emilia um, uh, philosophy and many centres, um, uh, preschool centres and uh, childcare centres are developing uh, what they consider to be Reggio Emilia programs. I'm not sure that the uh, Italian uh, people would actually think what they're doing is actually Reggio Emilia. And there's a danger in thinking you can transplant somebody else's style of program into your own community. And I'm not a great um, one for taking other people's uh, programs and thinking that you, they do well in your own country. I'm one for grassroots and developing programs, but I think some of the ideas and some of the philosophy around Reggio Emilia, and I think that what they talk about, the pedagogy of listening, is excellent. 
And so I'm not saying, OK, let's get rid of Reggie, I don't like it, but I'm saying let's look at their philosophy and let's see how we can engage with it in Australia rather than thinking we can just transplant it. Listening is a collaborative process. It requires active participation of adults, children and parents. Listening is being open to difference and to valuing others' points of view. Listening to children ensures that their point of view is taken into account. It gives meaning and value to the speaker. Listening to children legitimises the learner, makes them visible and enriches both the listener and the speaker. Adults need to take time to listen to children. I think, particularly in our early childhood field, we're always on about developing children's listening skills. We're not good about thinking about our own listening skills and how we can make sure we take time to listen to the children. Children need to develop skills in listening to staff and to other children. And I'll be uh, expanding on that in the workshop. Purposeful collaborative activity. Learning that shapes development takes place through active participation in purposeful collaborative activity. For a teacher to talk and a learner to learn, there needs to be a partnership where the talk and activity creates a shared framework of understanding underpinned by common knowledge, interests and goals. Talk provides the tool for creating a shared framework. Children need to have a sense of purpose in participating in interactions. And parents as partners, and I can't speak too strongly about the need to uh, ensure that parents are fully able to participate in the early child programs. A partnership is a working relationship that is ca characterised by a shared sense of purpose, mutual respect and the willingness to negotiate. Unique partnerships are unequal, flexible, complex, <coughs> challenging and rewarding. Thank you.